Welcome to this month's installment of Brass Chats, brought to you by Monster Oil. What is this? 21 year? Hey everybody, welcome back to Brass Chats again. Today we're sitting down with a gentleman who has played with more famous people than I care to count. People including Tom Brown, Chris Lane, Joel Baruti, and he actually has more Grammy nominations than I have teeth. Ladies and gentlemen, Randy Brecker. Greetings. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You guys were good. <laughs> <laughs> we just had a fun car ride. Um, you have played with so many people. Uh, Springsteen, Stevie Wonder, Horace Silver, Parliament, Sinatra, Jocko, James Taylor, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, on and on and on and on. Are there any musicians you've always wanted to play with, but um, for some reason it hasn't worked uh, out? Well, you know, uh, a couple of people come to mind. I've been asked that before. I never played with Sonny Rollins in any really intimate circumstance. Mm -hmm. So that he was one of my heroes growing up, still is. Uh, I'd love to have a chance to really have a conversation, a musical conversation with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I've never quite played with Herbie in a good circumstance. It's always been kind of like a, you know, expansive jam session. So I love to hear him really comp behind me. Those, yeah. those two guys come to mind. So. How many of your heroes, uh, when you were growing up, did you get to have a relationship and play with? Oh, well, quite a few. I was really lucky being in the right place at the right time. So some of my earlier heroes, uh, like from Philly, Lee Morgan, I got to know pretty well. Did you really? Yeah, and uh, and of course Freddie Hubbard and Woody mm -hmm. Shaw. I met when we were uh, same age, about nineteen uh -huh. years old. I had a very uh, great summer chasing one of my first girlfriends in Seattle, Washington, and that was a, 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 a influential summer for me where I met Larry Coriel, who I still play with to this day, and there were, it was just a lot happening in Seattle that summer. There was a club that featured uh, jazz bands for a week, so I heard Art Blakey with Lee Morgan, that's where I got to know him. Mm -hmm. Next week was Horace Silver with Woody Shaw, Joe Henderson, got to know them. There were jam sessions during the day, so yeah. we got to mix with all these great players. Uh, 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 Gary McFarland was there for a week. The Montgomery Brothers. It was just a great summer. So and this is you're talking about high school, right? This is uh, 19. I was 19. I was just after my first year at IU. Oh, okay. Um, what things were you doing that really helped you to improve as far as improvisation, as far as trumpet playing? From at that age when you were making big strides and really getting your basic trumpet skills together. Well, uh, number one, of course, on the trumpet side of things and the attitude side of things was studying with the great Bill Adam. So mm -hmm. that goes without saying. Uh, he had so many amazing students, such a positive uh, force. Uh, just an uh, amazing guy. He always stayed in touch uh, through his life. Uh, he was always just uh, such a positive influence on me, who was basically a pretty negative guy. So I always have to think of him. But also studies with Dave Baker, which was... a. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 I went to IU starting uh, in September of 63 through January of 66. Okay. And then we went on the State Department tour with our, our band. Uh, but uh, those years, Dave wasn't at school yet. He had been there to get a degree, but he was teaching privately in Indianapolis, and he was playing uh, cello, and he had a band. And I was lucky enough not only to study with him, but play in his band. It was c quite a great experience for somebody that age but I made I think leaps my playing improved uh, in leaps and bounds during those years because I it was such a great environment uh-huh so uh, let's that takes me to, to improvisation for a second um, there are several different ways that people go about improving in terms of improvisation yeah what which methods do you espouse and what what did you actually do were you jamming a lot we talked to Carl Saunders I think yeah. you may have seen the interview he said he just jammed all the time he said he never practiced he was just constantly jamming was that similar to you yeah I mean we tried to play I mean at school and whenever we had a chance we played that was number one but uh, let me this will probably be an elliptical answer because I don't think it was really a method but I played as much as possible and I certainly listened that was really important I listened carefully to records as deeply as I could I started, uh, let me just go back to the beginning. My father was a semi-professional jazz pianist, yep. so we had music at home. My earliest recollections, I started trumpet when I was eight. I started to improvise when I was about 
nine and a half, ten, by taking his records up to my room. Mm -hmm. Gave me a record player when I was ten years old, and he had just gotten his first stereo system. Imagine that, I'm aging myself when he was 40 or something. Do you remember what uh, some of those first records were oh, that you yeah, were jamming with? Sure, sure. I, I started with ballads. Round Midnight, 1955, and Miles Davis's first Columbia record that yeah. Dad played all the time. So I, I, I was just, it was common sense, 10-year-old sense, started with uh, that record. I started with My Funny Valentine, Chet Baker, Jerry Mulligan, and there was a record called Martians Come Back that Dad played a lot, Shorty Rogers and his Giants, uh, which conversely featured Jimmy Jufri on, on uh, clarinet when my brother was three years younger, started with that record. Oh, we really? both jam along with that record. So you were so, 11 years old or something when you were doing this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was 11. I, I was a hip kid when I was eight years old. I never forgot this. You know, we lived a block out of the city limits, a suburban environment, a terrible music program uh, in, in grade school. Not, and they're, they're much better now, and I hope they continue. Mm -hmm. We uh, had music class once a week, and we were each week, it was every, a certain student's week to bring in his favorite record and this was in the advent of Elvis and Love Me Tender and uh, everybody bringing in mostly the kids eight years old brought in Elvis I brought in Lambert Hendricks and Ross John Hendricks singing Cloudburst eight years old <laughs> so I was off and running at an early age so this wasn't the thing to do you were kind of well just because of the environment uh, our next door neighbor coincidentally was a, a, a fine tenor saxophonist I forget his last name Russ his sister was a fine jazz singer. It was just, in a way, happenstance, and Dad knew a lot of musicians. Oh, okay. So we had uh, jam sessions over, and when I got to be about 10 or 11, I remember, I've, I haven't told this story that much. This is interesting, too. The great John Hendricks was, uh, was friends with one of Dad's friends. He got snowed in, uh, and uh, they had a jam session with him singing, and, and this uh, Dad had gotten his first tape recorder. I must have been about 12 but no more, and I, I, I have the tune in my head. I could never quite remember the tune, but it was the first time I was recorded and I heard myself play, and I sounded, I have to say, I was playing completely by ear, but I, from listening so much, I really had a, a jazz conception. I played a couple phrases and everybody left in a, in a good way. They were very supportive. Yeah. And imagine this, I went to see John Hendricks when he was 85 uh, with James Moody, Mm -hmm. I had seen him a couple times briefly, but I hadn't really had a chance to really talk to him. And believe it or not, he asked me about that tape. Oh, really? Yeah, I said, do you, do you have that tape? And I said, oh, man, it's long lost. He said, no, that was history. So it was, that was my entry into uh, playing in front of other people and, and hearing myself. But I listened intently. I, uh, I uh, pr played whenever I could beyond my classical studies, even at that age, playing with records playing downstairs with dad. Uh, a little later, I transcribed, tra uh, I was about 14 or 15, I met a great trumpet player, Evan Solot, who uh, I uh, eventually took lessons with, with a great uh, trumpet teacher in New York, uh, in Philly, uh, which is where I'm from, mm -hmm. named Tony Marcion, and Evan could transcribe anything really quickly. He was about a year older than I, so I also got into uh, listening intently transcribing solos, not only trumpet players, but saxophone players. I started to uh, also figure out voicings on the piano. That really helped. Uh, Dad showed me a few things. And uh -huh. I started listening intently to Monk because he was all, the voicings were op more open, so they were easier to hear. Yeah. I, once again, with ballads, I, uh, 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 My Foolish Heart, I listened to that intently, the Bill Evans version. and. Mm -hmm figured out some voicing. So all these things combined into one kind of advanced my progress. And then This the, seems like a pretty common thing among jazz greats throughout history. You, you, you talk to a lot of them, you, you hear about them, you read about them. A lot of them learn in a similar fashion by a ton of listening, a ton of playing with anybody that they could find to play with. Yeah. And it seems like you did a similar thing. Well, this was before there weren't many people to study with. There certainly weren't programs, jazz study programs in Philadelphia. So you had to kind of fend for yourself, use common sense, and just apply whatever you could uh, figure out. Uh, and and like Carl said, play as much as you could. Too. What do you what do you think about jazz education today? 
Well, uh, I think it's great. I mean, there's uh, uh, there's so many great programs and the, and uh, uh, there's so many great young players. I do a lot of uh, uh, workshops and master classes and clinics all over, not only in the U.S. now, but all over the world. And uh, it's great for the kids to have everything at their fingertips and have all this information. If anything, there's maybe too inf too much information now. We ought to yeah. actually you know, go to record stores, find these records. You had to yep. go out and you, and you listen, also listen to the radio. There was a good jazz station right down the record. And then they were sometimes hard to find. Now everything, I certainly, man, I still spend hours listening. You know, I, uh, I, I still like to study uh, jazz history, go further back. I was like a hip kid. So, you know, I started with Clifford, who was from Philadelphia area, and Miles and Dizzy and mm -hmm. Lee Morgan, who later Freddie. I, I Anything before that was labeled as corny, so I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to listen to Louis Armstrong or, or any any stuff from the 20s, 30s, Bobby Hackett, or you know, uh, that stuff was corny. But now I certainly realize uh, uh, it's so great to to get to know all these other uh, uh, people's playing and then just piecing all the things together because you know I had a, basically both my brother and I we were kind of self-taught in that way you just mm -hmm. figure a way out and, what's uh, the biggest mistake young jazz players make in the in the practice room well that's a good question it's a different world today it's a different jazz education is completely different yeah, from when you're growing uh, up well like I said they're maybe fed so much information it's not really a mistake but it seems to be harder to uh, stylize your playing because you're given so much information that, a lot of players sound great, but it's hard to pick one for the other. Have to dig really deeper to get their sound. So I always recommend that you try to find in your playing and your voc jazz vocabulary what kind of sets you apart, and not only transcribe things, but I do this to this day. Uh, try to figure out your own licks, yeah. your own. Uh, I did a little of that, you know, in the car. I just play anything. You know, I played a couple of times. We played a tune. We were driving around. I was playing out the window. <laughs> Crazy guys. Uh, but I do that to this day. That's a big part of my, I just sit around and try not to think about it, but just play lines. And I've come up with any number of lines that end up being in tunes. Of, you know, the da -da 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 little eight note thing or whatever it is uh, in skunk fungal is just well, something do you, th do you think that students now are playing too academically do you think there's too much in textbooks studying harmonies yeah it's, I, I would say I mean it's great on one hand but just you just concentrate on trying to find your own voice and all that information yeah sure and it's harder to do uh, uh, and there there's just you know just great players out there now so I'm not trying to demean anything jazz yeah. education is is fantastic but uh I, my only recommendation is just try to concentrate on eventually find. Everyone has their own voice. It's just without being too conscious, try to look for it without you know getting obsessed with it. It'll yeah, happen sure. sooner or later. Hmm. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. What are you practicing now? What's on your music stand? Well, we just kind of built my music books are all in piles here. We just made this little studio bigger, but I still go back to the fundamentals. Do Adam's routine. Maybe Adam's not. routine to this day, you still do it. To this day, I still do that when I'm a good boy. I'm not saying <laughs> some days, look, you know, I have other things I have to do, but when uh, uh, I still enjoy doing that, I try to do some of the, the intermediate routine, and if I'm feeling really good, I have a more advanced routine. And when I do do it, it really helps set me up for the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to get that out of the way maybe earlier in the day. And if I don't get to it, then I start putting it on, you know, the whole routine. Oh, okay, well, I'll do something else for for now. But I, I start with that. I still like playing my uh, Arbenz. It's the stuff we're doing in the car, the basic, all the Clark books, Arbenz, uh, Sloshberg. Uh, 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 it just helps my uh, flexibility. I, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I know what I'm called for, so my practice is, is geared towards... Uh, Flexibility and jazz endurance, where you're playing a solo, and uh, and and uh, uh, I kind of gear my practice routine, seeing how many days I have to the next gig, and uh, I do the classical things just for the. I uh, enjoy doing it. Uh, I'm not still. I wouldn't consider myself by any stretch of the imagination a great classical player. I, Tony Marcion, my teacher, always uh, 
kind of laughed his way through the fact that I would doodle tongue the Arbenz book <laughs> unconsciously. And I, the, I was such a jazz fanatic, it crept its way into that whole. Sure. It was hard to keep it separate. Well, you mentioned jazz endurance. That caught my attention. What, what do you mean by jazz endurance, well, and how do you practice for that? Well, it's slowly, I, eventually, when it gets later, and I do this assiduously, I mean, it's the last thing I do every night before I go to sleep, sometimes earlier after my wife and kid go to sleep. I'm down here from about 9, 10 in the, at night to about 2 in the morning, putting on play-along records or just, and slowly just building up my endurance. If I'm just starting out, maybe I'll play eight bars. Sometimes I'll scat sing eight bar, a little trade with myself. But slowly but surely, if I take it slowly, rest when I start to get tired, day by day, as it inches towards the gig, I have to build up the fact that I'm going to play two sets, maybe three sets, where you're yeah. playing solos and stretching out and playing with the horn up, you know, all the time. It's not playing like playing in a big band or an orchestra where you have eight bars and then, you know, 32 bars rest, or if you're playing in a big band, which is another kind of endurance you yeah. build up. But uh, for the most part, I get a lot of calls playing my tunes, fronting a big band where I'm out there really, once I hit, it's just boom, you're playing. You've got to be ready, yeah. And uh, so that's what I concentrate on. Let's talk about, we, we mentioned earlier that uh, so many different people you've played with, uh, but from so many different genres of music that you've got to wear so many different hats yeah. to cover all these things. I'd love to hear some stories or some experiences you had with a few of these different people. i got a, a little list here. I'd love to hear like a okay. story about each, if you don't mind. Well, I hope I got some. <laughs> like Thad, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, a legendary band with some of the greatest recordings out there. What, how, many, how long did you play with them? About a year? Well, about a year. And imagine my, a thrill. I mean, uh, uh, You were young, me, just out of college, right? Well, I was right after that State Department tour. I mentioned this uh, in, the, in, in the car. We ended up in Greece, and we looked in Downbeat or some paper, and, or, and there was an international jazz competition in Vienna, 1966, mm -hmm. uh, either in June. I think it was in June. The judges were, were Art Farmer, J.J. Johnson, Cannibal Adderley, Joe Zolino, Ron Carter, and Mel Lewis. Imagine yeah. that. And it was put together by a wonderful classical-slash-jazz pianist named Friedrich Gulda. I think I would have peed my pants. Well, I pretty probably did, uh, <laughs> playing in front of those guys. But uh, be, even besides that, so, we, so three or four of us went to this, we found our way to Vienna from Greece. And at this uh, at competition, we were all, I was probably, so this was uh, six, I was 20 years old. Met people like uh, Franco Ambrosetti, great trumpet player, Swiss trumpet player Eddie Daniels was already playing with Mel's band, so it was kind of a f not fixed, but you know, oh, he was yeah, by yeah. far the greatest. But uh, also Miroslav Vitus, George Moraz, Claudio Roditi, Tomas Stanko, Jiggs Wiggum, uh, uh, oh Jakob Kuhn. We're all together in a youth hostel, jamming together, so That's we insane. got to know each other. So that yeah. also helped. We are, Several of us moved to New York. I decided to move to New York, and Mel... Uh, and they asked me shortly after I moved to, uh, they had an opening in the band, so next thing I know, I'm playing Monday nights. I couldn't believe it. All right, I got some other ones for you. Okay. Ready? Parliament. What is a Parliament gig like? Oh, boy. Well, just great. And we miss Bernie Worrell, who was the great, one of the greatest arrangers. That was just a, a session I'll never forget. We played on several tunes, Tear the Roof Off the Sucker, which became a big hit. And my favorite one, which is called Handcuffs. Uh, which check out just the greatest horn arrangement. I think if it was I'm not wrong, me, Mike, Fred, uh, Wesley, and Maceo. Oh, okay. And, and Joe Shepley. Maybe Mike wasn't <laughs> on that one. That sounds but, like a party. Uh, uh, okay, some quick stories about that. What was the gig like when you're at the gig? There's people going nuts. They're going crazy. Well, I mean, it was an overdub, but guys are in the in the booth going crazy over the horn stuff. Oh, you but, didn't you didn't play much live stuff with them? No. no oh, okay. No, recorded no. stuff. It was all uh, so how studio was the session? stuff. Well, they paid it. Their their production company was called Thang Inc. C H A N G. They were late to the session. I was in New York, and I, eventually I went down. It was on Forty Sixth Street, a place called Sound Ideas or something. George Clavin has uh -huh. a record company now. So I I went down to the street and just was kind of hanging out. And next thing I know, an old station wagon pulls out up. And all these guys, like eight guys, get out of the station wagon in full Parliament Funkadelic <laughs> regalia. All for a recording session. For a recording session <laughs> with the tapes under their arm, 
with not even in boxes. The tapes, literally, they had driven from Detroit. The leader, you know, hanging a dragon on the ground. I was like, holy moly. <laughs> uh, and Dennis Chambers was here. I didn't hadn't met him yet. He told me, I remember when you were standing, we pulled up, and there you were standing on the street, and we are going... There's Randy Brecker, and, the, and I'm going, boy, oh, there's the Parliament, there's George Clinton and Bootsy. And, uh, so uh, it was great. And, and then the playbacks, they were all in the booth, and the, on, particularly on handcuffs. George Clinton hits this high note, and they all just rolled on. They flipped out. They rolled on the floor with Lee. That's the only way I could <laughs> That's awesome. describe it. But that, that was also really just the writing was very influential to me, Fred yeah. Wesley and Bernie particularly. And, yeah. And... and Mazio's way of phrasing, the way they phrased, uh, you know, it was, it was all rooted in bebop, too. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember doing a session with Cameo, with Fred, uh, had done the charts on that one. Mike played some great solos on that record, Candy. Uh, and I said, turned to Fred and said, well, how do you want us to phrase this, all this stuff? There was no markings. He just looked at me and said, bebop it. So, you know, you, you talk about wearing different hats. Yeah. It's, it's closer than you think, particularly between those two elements. What know? about Art Blakey? Well, that summer in Seattle, and I and I, I for, for, forgotten about this, but I met Lee, and Lee heard me play at one of the jam sessions and uh, invited me to sit in. And I forgot all about this till I, I found a box down here of old letters to my mother. And apparently, I... Lee, they were playing a tune, and Lee motioned for me to sit in, and I jumped up on the bandstand. This is at this club called the Penthouse in Seattle. And I started to play, and Art Blakey looked around and went into a drum solo and started yelling at Lee, I told you I don't want anybody to sit in. And they start having an argument. Lee said, well, this kid can really play. He said, I don't care. I don't want anybody to sit in. Oh, but man. by a year later, and I, uh, I had forgotten all about it, uh, after Horace, a year and a half with Horace, Horace broke up the band in 69, and... And Art Blakey needed a, a trumpet player, and Woody helped ace me on that gig. My first night, I'll never forget. Uh, I knew the tunes. It wasn't a particularly great period in Art's life. He didn't have a book, so to speak. There were no, you know, I just knew the repertoire. Yeah. Our first night, we played at Slugs, and the front row was Freddie Hubbard and Woody. Oh, my God. So, okay, I'm looking down. I, <laughs> luckily, I knew most of the tunes. Uh, and I played with him off and on also for about a year, mostly in New York or the East Coast. Like I said, it was... What kind of work. band leader was he? He was uh, just loose. <laughs> it was a particularly loose period. I played a little drums. I could play like Art Blakey a little. He heard me once, and uh, in the middle of the set, he'd hand me the drumsticks. He'd go for his walk around <laughs> the block. So I actually played drums with Art Blakey. That's hysterical. Uh, what great. about a, a different one altogether? What about Bruce Springsteen? Well, that one, it's a, another good story, and I've heard it from both directions, but uh, we were called by his manager. forget how the connection, but that was me, and Mike, and I think it was trombone player, maybe Wayne Andre. On now, what two. year are we talking? Well, this is Born to Run, whatever, early yeah. 70s. Yeah, you know, yeah. This was his, kind of, his, it turned out to be his breakout record, and we were doing a lot of sessions then. This was in... But we show up at the date, it was at the record plan, I'll never forget that. And on the music stand is just three music papers ripped out of a loose leaf book. Mm -hmm. No no music, just the paper, blank. So, and it was a tune called 10th Avenue Freeze Out. Yeah. And it was a little more in the rock, it was a little, I must say, like kind of out of our element. So we were having trouble. First of all, we weren't really hired to arrange the thing. We said, well, okay, I guess we're going to have to come up with parts. So we were having some difficulty, but we a couple of, by a couple of hours later, we had come up with some ideas. So like it was a little out of our field of vision, so to speak. But in the middle of the thing, a guy comes running into the studio like a bombshell, saying, wait a minute, that sounds terrible. It's, uh, that's not right. It sounds terrible. And it, it turns out this was Miami Steve. Of uh, Miami Steve Van Zandt, who's still oh Steve Van Zandt, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Calling him Miami Steve. Oh, okay. So, and I've heard him tell the story from his point of view, and it's exactly the same thing. He was all embarrassed because he had he was not familiar with uh, studio guys. He didn't know m m me and Mike, or even I don't think he even knew Sanborn by that we were, you know, high kind of uh, 
well known at the time studio guy so he yeah. was pretty insulting about the whole thing anyway we finished the tune he had I uh, certain ideas he should have shown up a couple hours earlier just he had certain ideas that worked really well with the tune so he kind of we started out all over again and, and oh, man. wrote out the parts and the other t tune which I played on which was called the meeting across the uh, the river was uh, uh, was an overdub so I just played along with the existing thing, and I, oh. I think I got lucky. I just did it once or twice, and they liked it. And, and it's people seem to like that one. I just was, uh, when I hear it, it's kind of a smoky trumpet sound. So that was got to know Bruce. Kind of uh, hung out a couple of times. I knew uh, good guy. His secretary, yeah, he was really exactly what he exudes, just yeah. kind of unassuming, uh, straight ahead guy. You know? Yeah, let's go on to some of the Brecker Brothers stuff. Um, Talk to me a little bit about, about I know you've, you've talked about this at length uh, over yeah. time, but uh, what was your childhood like with your brother? Did you kick his butt a lot? You were the older brother. Well, yeah, I, I, I didn't even have a chance to kick his butt because he started <laughs> later. And so, I mean, getting serious about it, he assiduously, assiduously took his clarinet lessons. Uh, but like I said, he never really connected with the instrument. A funny story I always tell, and this is a facetious comment, but here is years later, one of the last gigs we did, did together, we were playing at the Buddy DeFranco Jazz Festival. Buddy, great clarinet player, and this was a totally facetious comment, but Buddy was wailing away on a tune, and Mike whispered in my ear, you know, I still hate the clarinet. So, <laughs> <laughs> but he got a good foundation, but he wasn't serious about music. He also was tall, thin, he had, was a good basketball player. He was into basketball, being on a basketball team. He... Uh, had a, 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 a was kind of a scientist. He had, a, you know, what do you call it? A science set. What do you call it? I can't. Uh, uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You Chemistry know, he center. was in the basement uh, mixing things, and uh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, in ninth grade. Now I was already, I guess I had just left, and I was studying with Dave Baker. Uh -huh. I would send him my lessons. I'd copy him over, and I sent him some uh, Dave Baker licks. He had discovered Cannonball in ninth grade. This was kind of later, because remember, I started really improvising when I was, and, and yeah. had a love of the thing early. So his that started getting him serious. He loved Cannonball, and then when he settled on train, that was it. So oh, and yeah. all the basketball and the science projects, that, that all fell by the wayside. Now, what were the gigs like? The, the early, I mean, some of those early records are legendary, and they got so many great tracks, and you guys played live from time to time. What were these gigs like? What was the energy like in that band at the time? Well, it was great in the fact that we were all best friends. It was really a, a band of brothers, you know, like you, uh, like you guys have. You know, you can tell how close you all are. We, we were just all best friends. So we had previously played in a group called Dreams, Yeah. Uh, where we jammed up a lot of the stuff. Put out two well, albums. Yeah, two yeah. albums with Mike and eventually Will Lee, Don Grolnick, who were also in Brecker Brothers. We yeah. stayed friends. And, and I kind of caught on the idea. Uh, dreams had broken up, and uh, we, we ended up, uh, Billy Cobham had left to join Mahavishnu, and we couldn't quite find a drummer that matched his skills. We gave up, and uh, I rejoined Horace with my brother, uh, with Will, and Alvin Queen, who I still play with occasionally, great drummer. But somewhere along the line, we joined Billy Cobham's band, and I started formulating this idea of having a horn section with me, Mike, and a guy I had met at band camp when I was 15 at IU, Dave Sanborn. Mm -hmm. He had moved to New York. Uh, he was living in Woodstock, and he moved to New York. I thought, man, Mike and Sanborn would really sound great together. So that was kind of the instigator behind me starting to write. And also, like I mentioned earlier, trying to find your own voice, I wanted to find kind of my place. So I started just uh, as a hobby, really, writing music at home. It's such a crossover genre that you guys created. It's, I guess it came from Bitches Brew and all the stuff that Miles was doing in the late 60s. But I still listen to those recordings. I'm trying to figure out if you had anything in your mind. Were you just writing down stuff you thought was cool? Did you have a musical direction you wanted the band to take? Did you want it to be pop? Did you want it to be jazz? Or did you not even care? Well, I didn't care. I just <coughs> had, I was just writing. And, and for the, I, I had no idea it would become as popular as it did, and I'll tell you why it did in a second. I, uh, one of the first tunes was Skunk Funk, where I had little bits and pieces, and uh, this was before all this technology, but I was very uh, careful about 
cassettes. I labeled every cassette. I would just play at the piano, and it was still stunning harmony in theory. I sometimes I didn't know I could play piano pretty well, but I didn't, technically I was just like, well, this triad sounds good with this bass note. I didn't know maybe the m melodic minor mode that the reason they'd all fit together was just mostly ear stuff and i would just write it down on score paper i had a good idea of the guys i wanted to play so that was also helped mm -hmm. but i ended up writing nine tunes and we by happenstance among them skunk funk and uh and uh squid not squids uh sponge and uh we ended up by happenstance getting a record deal because clive davis had started a new company called arista and I got called by one of his producers, Steve Backer, and we had worked for Clive with Dreams. We were when yeah. he was president of Columbia, and Steve Backer called up and said, "You know, I've heard about this music. It's kind of through the grapevine, and I know you're going to go out and do some demos. But if you call this band, the Brecker Brothers, we'll sign you." And I and I this was and I had my intent was to do a solo record. Really, I had written all this stuff, and we had been rehearsing, and it sounded good and uh, it was kind of just mixing all the jazz elements kind of jazz voicings jazz harmony with funk rhythms was just kind of the cumulative uh some of all the things i had done up to that point that's the yeah. only way i could describe it it was a little different it was a little tighter not like dreams because i wrote everything carefully out there was not a lot of freedom but there, conceptually we all had the same concept as far as the way we read the parts and our way we utilize vibrato and the nuances and we played together quite a bit so you're unquestionably the leader of the band you were the, the one point, kind of yeah. in charge of yeah, the whole I thing i produced the record and uh was I it all started... collaboratively written sort of or no not that first record okay it was all just stuff i had written but about a week later i finally relented because it was a nice opportunity and i said to steve you know it's going to look funny because there's three horns out front but you call it the brecker brothers it's a nice opportunity so we would go in Recorded all the stuff really easily. I had learned certain techniques from playing with Blood, Sweat, and Tears and doing sessions as far as double tracking the horns, editing, and how to build from the bottom. You know, just how to do a, that kind of record. Mm -hmm. I, I had experience from doing uh, so many sessions. I go into Clive's office. He says, Man, I love everything you recorded, but you guys need a single. And basically he said, you know, I started to protest because, look, first of all, I thought this was going to be my solo record, you're calling it Brecker Brothers, and I wanted it to be the stuff I had written. He said, basically said, if we didn't do a single, he's not going to, you know, promote it. Oh, so man. I tell everybody, we trudge back into, we had a little rehearsal space, and the force was with us that day. I still, <laughs> among all these cassettes you saw, I have this cassette. We jammed up a tune in about three hours called Sneaking Up Behind You. And now on that one, that was a collaborative effort. Everybody had little ideas, me, Sanborn, Mike, Will, and Grolnick, basically. Mm -hmm. Steve Kahn was there and Chris Parker. And we went in the studio, recorded it. Clive heard it, loved it, thank God. <laughs> and that tune is what really sold the whole thing, not skunk funk, not oh, all the stuff. Oh, interesting. Okay. I wrote it. It got up to about number two or three on the on the urban charts, the R and B charts. And, oh, okay. And in a nutshell, that's what sold the thing. So I, it's something that I thought would sell 5,000 records, which was usual for a jazz record or whatever. Next thing I know, the thing sold 150,000, 200. That were moving up to pop charts. We're sitting at night because we hung out every night in a place called, uh, I can't think of the name right now, but... Uh, buying billboard going holy moly this stuff is going <laughs> so the next thing we know we, we were so busy in the studio so it was hard to get everybody together but we did tour around some clive was always trying to get us on the road yeah we were all saying well we have a lot of dates this week i know maybe next week we'll go but, so uh, um uh so who came to your shows was it jazz aficionados was it kids well r&b fans it who was came? Mostly, i mean the beginning it was mostly r&b fans in fact uh the Brecker Brothers, uh, people thought we were black. And I remember one clear cat came back in the dressing room, we're the Brecker Brothers, we're the Brecker Brothers. And we go, eh, we're the Brecker Brothers. <laughs> and the Excuse look me, of I'm disappointment right <laughs> on his face was uh, palpable. But yeah, we would we would open the show, you know, I think it, it might have been, uh, I think it was Dreams, but we would play gigs opposite most R&B bands, Chaka and Rufus, I still have some of the posters, and uh, we were on that circuit. But slowly but surely, the other tunes kind of 
caught on skunk funk and the musicians it was a longer process and the musicians started picking up on it and and schools as jazz education i don't know it just was a slower process but the, the the fact that the thing sold that much other people started hearing about it musicians jazz yeah. music, people from all different walks of life europe in particular was very popular over there yeah, so how was it received by jazz musicians and jazz critics from the uh, beginning Pretty, pretty well for the most part. I mean, the staunch jazz critics, you know, uh, and and some jazz musicians. I, I remember doing a gig opposite Roland Kirk, and he took offense to the fact that we're too much. I remember a guy yelled in the audience. We were playing in Philly, our hometown, too. He said, uh, a guy in the audience yelled, Roland, uh, Rassan, Roland Kirk said, Rassan doesn't need all those amplifiers. So <laughs> we got a little negative feedback from the purists, so to speak. Uh, yeah. But it was something a little different, and for the most part, people really enjoyed it, I have to say. What do you think have been the lasting uh, musical impacts of your group? Because it seems like you kind of broke down some barriers in a way. Uh, I don't know, maybe musically and culturally? I'm not, what yeah, do you, what do you so. think came from it? Well, certainly that one tune became Skunk Funk. Here it is, whatever it is. I have, what is it, 40 years later, 45 years later, it was 1975 became kind of like a rite of passage with young players. And, yeah. You know, there's like, you put you put in Skunk Funk on uh, YouTube and there's 33,000, uh, you know, uh, hits on it. I don't think 33,000 versions, but I've seen <laughs> Serbian yeah. tap dancers, sure. you know, uh, Japanese string orchestras, uh, just every configuration that you can possibly imagine of... of uh, of people doing that tune, so I, it uh, seems like you guys got an entirely new generation of people interested in jazz. You well, I hope so. It. And also, you know, obviously Mike's playing had a lot. He was such a virtuoso and Sanborn on those first couple records. Mm -hmm. uh, it was such a different thing. Mike's t technique and his whole virtuosity was astounding. So I think that also obviously helped. And in, in retrospect, calling it Brecker Brothers and the fact that we were brothers and that also people enjoy the family thing and. Uh, I think that had a big impact too, but it's it's nice to look back on it and see. Like I just explained, it was just kind of happenstance. I just wanted to write as a hobby, really, and look what happened. So it's a right place, a right time. But I always counsel kids. You know, when opportunity knocked, I had something to offer. So I was mentioned to young kids. You know, now's the time. Don't wait. You know, put bands together. Try to find people you enjoy yeah. playing with. I've been playing with. Some of those guys since I was 15. Grolnick was at the band camp. Will I met when he was 17. You know, we go back all those years. We still love playing together, the guys who were left. And I, I counsel young kids, you know, now's the time. The Charlie Parker tune, like, find guys you like to play with, try to find your voice, write, get to a piano, try to write tunes, write original material. That's a good way yeah. to, to discover yourself, which is what I was trying to do. Now, what... Um what would you and your brother be doing right now? What do you think? Well, man, I wish I knew. Well, we would. Which direction was he heading in, and did you, did you what did you think was gonna the well, music was gonna go with between the two of you guys? Oh, uh, well, that's a good question. You know, he was taken ill so suddenly. I'll tell you what direction he was going in, and hopefully, this music will. He was just a scientist till the bitter end. He got interested in Bulgarian folk music. Okay. Seriously interested. Studied with. Uh, whatever Bulgarian musicians were in New York, some of them were driving cabs, he researched it, he kind of reinvented the way he played, and uh, there, there are uh, uh, sequences of him playing this stuff, which is also just completely different than anything else you ever heard. It's never seen the light of day. There's some interest in, in, in uh, record companies now to try to finish his unfinished work. So that, yeah. that was the direction he was going. And myself, I was going kind of more... I think uh, in a in a we had both kind of have it, had it with uh, playing with a lot of effects and amps. We were go, getting more down to basics, I think. So we, I think we probably would have gone in that direction too. But we liked playing together in a lot of different circumstances. All all those years, we were also playing with, for instance, Hal Galper quintet. We were playing a lot of jazz. So you really enjoyed playing together over all those years with your brother. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it was Michael Brecker. Well, I yeah. know. It just, it just seems, I imagine playing like with my sister or something, well, it'd be like, and just butting heads because like, yeah, the siblings it was great. stuff. I mean, and... we, we, had, you know, we had our moments of, not serious, we, it wasn't like the Dorsey brothers, right? We, we really got along pretty well, and I was 
you know, in awe of his virtuosity. In a way, he was in awe of the fact that I, I think I had a big influence on his writing or conception because I started doing that before he did, and I would kind of push him along to write. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just had a ball together. Oh, that's I miss awesome. miss him so much. And we, was, we would definitely still be playing together if he was still here. We had all plans. We were supposed to go to Russia when he was taken. We had a bunch of stuff that's right. yeah, planned yeah. When, yeah. when he was taken ill. We miss him. Yeah. Ten years. It'll be ten years next January. Are you interested in uh, moving on to the monster round? Okay. <laughs> You're you familiar got, with the monster round, right? That's where you just kind of asking, uh, is that the stream of consciousness? or is I, I, I can't tell you what it is. Okay, okay. Okay. It's, it's top super secret. Okay. Ultra secret. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Favorite uh, place to play the trumpet? Uh, actually, upstairs in that living room. But I, I, I like it down here, but that's got the perfect acoustic. So this week I was up there because my wife and kid weren't here. Love that room. Favorite drummer you've never played with? Tony Williams on an intimate circumstance. Played with him a couple times, but it was always, like I said earlier with Herbie, never, yeah. never where I could really communicate with him. Name a poster you had on your wall as a child. Muddy Waters. Well, that was later. You had okay. Muddy on your wall, huh? Nice. Well, no, that was later. Okay, as a child, I don't think I had any posters, believe it or not. It was before posters. But I was, okay. if, if I had a poster or something to hang up, probably would have been Miles. Oh, okay. Uh, what's, the, what's the first record you wore out? The first record I wore out probably was that record I mentioned earlier, even though I understand it. Uh, the Miles one? Around about midnight. Uh, previously, some Charlie Parker records. Dad had some 10-inch. Uh, I loved the sound of something, even though it wasn't a trumpet, just his, his the way he got around eighth notes, the way he phrased. But uh, And studying Brown, the early Clifford Brown records, because uh, Clifford was active in Philadelphia, and I remember the day he was killed, Dad reading about it, so I was a big fan. I wore those records out. I just yeah. loved the way he played. Equipment. Are you an endless tinkerer, or do you just grab the first thing you see and play it? Well, that's a good one, and it goes in stages. I'm in a mouthpiece tinkering stage now. Ah, mouthpiece tinkering. Okay. But mainly because my old mouthpiece has kind of got a little too many nicks in the, in the rim, and I was forced to... Uh, Futs around, but I've been having some success with it. Okay. Um, have you, <laughs> I don't know why I asked this question. Uh, have you ever saved a person's life? Well, that's a good question, and believe it or not, I don't remember this, and I owe him a phone call, and thank you, but the great pan player, Othello Molino, according to him, I saved his life in the ocean once when we were Seriously? on tour with Jocko. I don't remember. He said I pulled him in. He was having trouble. Oh, man. And, uh, uh, Okay. I, I didn't, at the time, realize, I, I guess I was doing it, that he was in as much trouble, but he, he mentioned that to me. You've saved more lives than I have, and I'm in the Coast Guard. Well, That's amazing. What's the best book you've read in the last year? Okay, I'm going to stick up for my friend Barry Finnerty, who wrote a book called Start. It's about, he was a guitarist with uh, Miles, Crusaders, and also Heavy Metal Bebop, Brecker Brothers. He wrote a book called Start kind of semi-autobiographical, just came out, I just finished reading it, and it's a really kind of fascinating uh, story of the times in the 70s, his crazy life. Oh, yeah, yeah, the one you were talking about in the car, yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 just really well done, and it's also an audio book. Also, I'm reading now, uh, this is a long answer, but I like reading jazz biographies. I'm also reading... Uh, 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 Benny Golson's by uh, oh, I haven't read that. It's really he's a really great writer, and uh, it's called uh, Whisper Nut. Oh, okay. I'm in the middle of that, so those are two recent ones. What players, dead or alive, do you choose to be in your dream rhythm section? Oh, well, lucky enough to still play with Jimmy Cobb, but I think Winton Kelly and Paul Chambers. Okay. <laughs> That was a hard one. Yeah. What's the more... Uh, Maybe Bill the, Evans, too. Both of those. Bill Evans and Winton switching off during the... <laughs> okay. <so they're>, <laughs> we'll just do forehand. Yeah. What's the most important quality in a band leader? Well, knowing that fine line between being a strong band leader and giving latitude to the sidemen. Do you own an Amazon Echo? No. Name a pop song that you're embarrassed to admit that you like. Well, uh, 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 I love Johnny Cash. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Outside of music and family, 
Who has been the biggest influence in your life? I like reading positive stuff. Dalai, I mean, I don't know if he's the biggest, but it came to mind because I like reading his books. The Dalai Lama. Sure, oh, yeah. sure. Favorite painting? I think that one by Vincent Van Gogh, maybe Starry Night. Okay. What jazz great would make the best president? Oh, Dizzy for president. Dizzy. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Favorite big man of all time? Uh, well, I think the most one that was influential in my life and I think was set the the standard. Uh, it's hard to say, so I, I'll go with that and Mel, but, but you know, I can't deny Duke and yeah. Count Basie. So. Is there anything that you hate practicing but need to practice? Well, nobody, I think, likes practicing long tones and doing the routine. That's, that's kind of drudgery, the more calisthenic side of... Uh, I, I also try to do Carmine stuff, and it's it's kind of drudgery, but uh, yeah. but uh, you know you do it. What's the craziest jam session you ever part of? Uh, I, I I judge at the monk competition one during the, usually the trumpet ones, but a couple of years ago the theme was women in jazz, and I happened to be in Washington D.C. and so they invited me to play. My wife was playing on that one. Mm -hmm. and they had Aretha, and uh, the last tune of the night was just one of those crazy things with a bunch of uh, different it was a drum competition and we each had to play got a chance to play two choruses of I Got Rhythm and I and Herbie was there Jimmy Heath uh, Madeline Albright had been playing with Chris Bodie she was off to the side playing when was this this is about four years ago oh, okay she was not secretary but she played with Chris Bodie he was there she played the <laughs> drums with mallets she was off to the side great drummers there though uh, trading off behind me. Uh -huh. Jimmy Cobb was there. Peter Erskine. Holy Vin, Vinnie cow. Vinnie yeah. uh, Maybe Roy Haynes. And it got to my chance. I'm not looking. I'm just seeing they're all switching. I get to do my two choruses of I Got Rhythm. And then I sounded terrible. I couldn't play. I just couldn't find a groove. I was saying, man, this is, I can't play. I turn around. Who was my drummer? Tipper Gore. <laughs> <laughs> So All those great been, drummers at the session. I get Tipper Gore. So that might have been the craziest session I can remember. Oh, that's really. horrible. Uh, two more questions. Okay. Have you ever had a gun pulled on you? Uh, yeah. Oh, how many times? More yeah. than once. Yeah, more than once. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe uh, well, two that I remember that I know. Wow. Uh, twice. Yeah, I got robbed at gunpoint once in a, in Seattle. Uh, in a parking lot, luckily it uh, didn't go off. But you know, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I had a, one other time that I won't even go into because sure, sure. of the guys around still. <laughs> what's oh? <laughs> I think he is. Ooh, trying to guess on the way yeah. home. Uh, well, what's it's, the it's, what's the best advice you were ever given? Oh uh, well, two things: listen and uh, Mr. Adam, patience. One word answer. Randy Brecker. Thanks so much for joining All us. All right, it's thanks. Been a real you guys pleasure. are great. I really had a good time. Oh, so. yeah.